Good morning, and welcome to Morning Movie News. In yesterday's episode, I talked about how Sony had set a release date for The Amazing Spider-Man 3 and 4, 2016 and 2018. Yet later, the very same day, a news story broke, which totally cast a different light on the franchise Sony is trying to build, and also uh, answered the question as to whether or not they're going to remain faithful to the Spider-Man mythos. And it looks like they're not going to, which is weird to me, because I thought that was kind of the calling card of this whole reboot, uh, you know, how they were selling it. Uh, so what was the news? It was that Shailene Woodley, who, from The Descendants, who had been cast as Mary Jane Watson, was being dropped from the film as well as the character. Uh, and the reason that was given was Mark Webb, the director, said that he was thinking about how the film was going to come together, uh, and he decided, you know what, I think that the Mary Jane character, she's only in a few scenes as it is, and she detracts from the very important Gwen Stacy-Peter Parker relationship. Uh, and as we all know, it's been re widely reported that it seems that this second film is going to feature the death of Gwen Stacy because uh, Emma Stone has been featured on a bridge wearing pretty much a modern version of the outfit that, she fam that Gwen Stacy famously wears in that iconic issue. Uh, so I feel this happened for two reasons, none of which are the answer that Mark Webb gave. Uh, the first is, is that perhaps I feel that Divergent, you know, Entertainment Weekly has a cover coming out for it. Uh, it's going to be their cover story. Divergent is a, a major uh, Hunger Games-esque uh, film that's coming out that's based also based on a novel. Uh, and I think that uh, they might feel that that's going to be her thing and they don't, they don't want to kind of have to split their publicity. Uh, which is weird because I think that Jennifer Lawrence in The Hunger Games, that success has only uh, cemented her role as Mystique in the X-Men films. And they don't seem to have any problem over there at Fox. But then Fox never seems to have a problem with anything. Uh, continuity and quality be damned. Uh, so, so anyway, back to Spider-Man. I think that so I think that they might be like, well, you know what? It's not a huge role, and we want someone who's going to def be defined as Mary Jane, uh, not have to share her with another franchise. However, I also feel there might be some chance they looked at the dailies and they feel may that they miscast Mary Jane once again. You know, they always keep trying to change Mary Jane Watson in the movies. Kirsten Dunst was infamously cast in the role. Uh, and the thing is, is that Mary Jane Watson is a supermodel. She's a fashion model. That's the character. Uh, I know it's difficult sometimes to make that kind of a character likable, but I, I know there are actresses who can pull it off. You know, through the years we've had, um, you know, Michelle Pfeiffer, uh, Charlize Theron, uh, Nicole Kidman, a number of actresses who have that, um, you know, Halle Berry even, have this, this model-esque look. I think Halle Berry's not quite as tall as the other ones, but, you know, have a supermodel look. Uh, and are, you know, are liked by audiences. They're, they're related. They're nice. They're relatable. Uh, and so I think it can be done. And, and you know, I'll get to it in a moment why Mary Jane is likable, even though she's, you know, a, like a high, high gloss supermodel. So I think, but, you know, of course there's the speculation that they based this Mary Jane on Brian Michael Bendis' ultimate comics Mary Jane, where she's not a supermodel. She's uh, an aspiring journalist, which I think just kind of makes her Lois Lane, uh, like a nerdy Lois Lane they kind of turned her into. I don't, I'm, not, I'm not a huge fan of that uh, either. Uh, and, and so you basically have a, you know, you have a situation, and I, they did that also, by the way, with Ultimate Spider-Man, I believe, because of Kirsten, the Kirsten Dunst movie, of that casting. They changed it for that. So it was kind of just a little bit of a, you know, a big a ball of knots. But, so anyway, I think they might have felt, you know what, this movie, this movie's going to take a lot of heat. We, did, we cast it so well the first time, I think a lot of fans might complain about Shailene Woodley in the role of Mary Jane Watson. Nothing against Shailene Woodley, she just isn't Mary Jane Watson, uh, a famous character. So I think that might be the other reason that she was cut, because they said they will not be using her again. They're going to probably recast, well, they said probably, but I think if you say probably, it means you're definitely going to. They're going to recast the role for The Amazing Spider-Man 3. So why is this a problem? Why do I think beyond, you know, kind of being a bruised, a black eye for Shailene Woodley and just kind of, you know, hurting the film a little bit? And that's because it's so important to the story of uh, the death of Gwen Stacy that Mary Jane be around when it happens because she's also Gwen Stacy's friend. When she meets Peter Parker, even though they, you know, their first interaction is a blind date that uh, they've been set up on by her aunt and uh, Aunt May, or her, some relation to Mary Jane Watson, their neighbors. Uh, but the situation is, you know, they're all friends. And what brings uh, Mary Jane Watson and Peter Parker together is the death of Gwen Stacy, uh, being, you know, mourning that, mourning uh, his girlfriend, her friend, and that, that's what brought them together. And I think it's important to, to show that. I think it shows a really great side of Mary Jane Watson. You know, aside from the face of Tiger, you just hit the jackpot, you know, that famous uh, snarky line. Uh, you know, it shows that she's, has a, she's a real, 
she's a relatable member of the social group, not just some, not a rebound date for Peter Parker after Gwen Stacy. You know, he, you know, might have even killed Gwen Stacy. So I don't. So that's exactly the problem. I don't like turning her into a rebound. And also, I think it it takes away a little bit from what Gwen Stacy means to Peter Parker. If he knows Mary Jane while he knows Gwen Stacy, that means he still chose to continue to date Gwen Stacy. You know, he wasn't like, that, that's the girl for me, see ya Gwen. Uh, I think it's important to show that only when Gwen Stacy was tragically taken away from him did he come to, he, did he fall in love with Mary Jane Watson, not because she was a hot supermodel, which is something that hadn't appealed to him, you know, hadn't been, an, uh, I'm sure it maybe <laughs> it appealed to him on some level, I'm sure, but it wasn't enough to get him to break up with Gwen Stacy because she was his true love. That's what brought them together. And it's often talked about in the comics that Mary Jane is aware that she's not the love of Peter Parker's life. She, she's a more, more for, for, first and foremost, his best friend. So I would have liked to have seen that develop. And I think that I know that a uh, Andrew Garfield and Amanda, uh, Emma Stone are dating in real life. And I think that it would be uh, unfortunate to try to have that bleed into the movie and translate into that and to not give Mary Jane Watson the introduction that she deserves. All right, so that's the first story. Second story of the day is that the Star Wars casting uh, breakdowns came out. Uh, this is being reported uh, across the internet. And they so it, there's no speculation as to who the characters are, but it's just basically who they're looking for. Oh, uh, you know, the, um, so I have the story right here. So excuse me for a moment so, so I can read it to you. Uh, they're looking for a young man between the ages of 20 and 25, witty and smart, fit but not classically handsome. Uh, a man in his late 20s, also fit, but this one is handsome and confident. Uh, a late teenage girl, independent, good sense of humor, also physically fit. Uh, second young female. Don't they hire physical uh, trainers anymore to get these people actors into shape? Uh, so, I mean, I can't believe they're making you do it on your own time. Uh, also, a second young female, also late teens, tough, smart, and physically fit. Men in his 40s, obviously physically fit. This one is a military type. Men around 30 or so, the intellectual type. I guess that's our professor. And finally, a guy aged around 70, strong opinions and tough. So these are the casting breakdowns that they send out across Hollywood just to get people to submit their um, their talent. And of course, if it's at Star Wars, they're not going to give any more than that because it's a closely guarded secret. So do I have a problem with this? I'm afraid I do. I know that this is just so little information to go off of. How could I possibly be uh, disappointed in it? Now, you know what? You know what my problem is? There's only two female roles here, and they're both, uh, what is it, uh, late teens. Yeah, they're both women in their late teens. Not even, you know, 20s. And I feel like uh, if you want to have, like, I think it's Ahsoka is the name of that character, that Jedi apprentice in the, the Clone Wars. If you want to have a teenage girl play her or some character like that, great, that's wonderful. But I'm getting pretty tired of having a lot of, a, a wide demographic of male characters, you know, different ages, a, a different span, different, you know, because there are different types of men in the world. I would really love to see different types of women represented here. Uh, and, and I'm disappointed in J.J. Abrams that, uh, and also Kathleen Kennedy. I mean, come on, Kathleen Kennedy. You're a female producer. Uh, I don't understand why Kathleen Kennedy, Christopher Nolan's wife, Emma Thomas, and Zack Snyder's wife, uh, Deborah, Deborah Snyder, why these women producers aren't doing anything about uh, producing these films. At least Linda Opst over at Interstellar has uh, Jessica Chastain and Anne Hathaway over there, uh, actresses who, I, you know, at least are, I, th I believe, in their 30s. Uh, you know, I just feel that to always constantly put out this idea that women are only only matter if they're uh, the younger they are, the, the better is uh, is frustrating, and that's never been Star Wars's game. And I would, I really, it's really unfortunate, annoying. Okay, so but hope, maybe they've already cast some older women, or you know, some range. That maybe that's what we'll get. Maybe Helen Mirren's already on board. So anyway, those are the first two stories of the day. The third story of the day is a very sad story that broke um, very late yesterday, uh, at least East Coast time. I logged on to check the news story, so I'll make sure I didn't miss anything. And I saw the tragic headline that James Gandolfini passed away of a heart attack at the age of 51. And it's really tragic to see someone's life, at any time, to see someone's life uh, cut short. But to have someone, uh, you know, only make it to 51, you know, is, is really, you know, and I think that it's important to realize that even though this is, you know, this is a star, so his, it makes headlines, it, it, it's something to, to address with the uh, uh, um, health issues in this country. You know, they talk about recently about, uh, people are upset about the potential soda ban that uh, Mayor Bloomberg wants to impose on the city. And everyone's like, oh, everyone should be able to do whatever they want. 
And, uh, you know, it's like if you're not aware of the argument, there's a proposed soda ban here where it's not banning soda, but you have to be able to offer people a normal size to buy instead of these 16, 32 ounce cups. And they have very compelling commercials here. They have a guy sitting at a counter eating sugar packs, like 16 sugar packs, and everyone's looking at him like he's nuts. And they're like, you wouldn't eat 16 packets of sugar. Why would you drink it? And there's a real obesity epidemic in this country. You know, Governor Chris Christie just recently got a lap band, and there was discussion as to whether or not he could responsibly run the country as president uh, if, he was, if he couldn't control his weight and if he could potentially, you know, he could die out of a heart attack at any moment, like, unfortunately, so tragically James Gandolfini did. And it, it's just... James Gandolfini certainly shouldn't be judged at, uh, by how he died and, you know, the, the problems he had with his weight. He was a really talented actor uh, and the star of one of HBO's most famous iconic shows, The Sopranos, and a very hardworking director behind, uh, and I mean, uh, producer behind the scenes. If you go online on Deadline, they have a really interesting story about the projects that he leaves behind, uh, tr sadly, through his company, mostly through, most of them actually through HBO. But I also think that I would hope that this would be, you know, a, 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 th a warning sign. You know, count yourself lucky to have this warning sign on uh, a wake up call that, you know, we. It's not a matter of choice, and you know, keep in mind that the food companies uh, are use science to manipulate your people's brains to make you want to eat more, not feel hungry. If you look into this just a little bit, it's really shocking that you know how the companies do not have your best interest at heart. The food companies, and they really know what they're doing to manipulate your uh, your your brain and your cravings. That the government really needs to step in at some point and, and take care of this. Uh, and you know, my my, hat, my my condolences to James Gandolfini's family, and uh, and I add my sympathies with the rest of the entertainment community uh, to to a really fantastic actor. All right, so um, it feels kind of silly to answer a question after that, but I try to answer a question every day. So the one I wanted to go into real quick was people. Someone asked me. There's been so much debate about Rotten Tomatoes with Man of Steel, and someone said, you know what? I don't understand what exactly Rotten Tomatoes is and why everyone's saying there's a discrepancy between the Rotten Tomatoes score and the uh, the critics rating and the audience rating. And uh, you know, this is like, this is a really frustrating, becoming a very frustrating subject. It's news. I, I want to cover it as part of my job, I need to cover it, but it seems that some people are only happy if I say exactly what they want me to say, uh, which, is not, which is not news. And you know, by the way, I could, if I was trying to manipulate the story, I would say, oh, everybody hates this movie, it's only a small contingent that likes it. You know, and I was, I'm, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying I believe it's like 50-50 split. Uh, maybe 60-40 in one direction. I'm not sure yet. As I've said, we'll have to wait and see what happens with the second weekend in terms of the box office and see how it holds up. Uh, but anyway, with Rotten Tomatoes, the critics' score is that they take all the critics out there, um, they go out and they actively find the top critics, I believe, and then if you're a smaller critic, you can sign in. Uh, you can sign up. That's why they have a uh, top critic section. Uh, but anyway, the reason I find that to be a more valid rating uh, or a, a valid rating. I don't think the audience score is valid at all, and I'll get into that in a second. But the reason that's a valid rating is because that's t they have they do pretty much have every critic on there, uh, and so that is a good way to gauge what the critical how the critical community feels about a movie. Because Rotten Tomatoes does make the effort to go out there and make sure that's an accurate rating. Uh, so they get so because that's what because they get every critic. You know, I would say every critic that matter uh, that's you know has any kind of following is on Rotten Tomatoes. So that is that they are getting that that snapshot. Uh, as for the audience score, if Rotten Tomatoes were to get every ticket buyer and get them to vote uh, about the quality of the film, then that audience score would also be considered accurate or semi-accurate. But it's not. That is a completely voluntary system. Uh, I mean, I would be interested to know here how many people have ever voted on Rotten Tomatoes uh, with a score. I, I've never done it, and you know, so that's the thing. I mean, if it, it's not making an effort to get everybody, Rotten Tomatoes, the critical score goes out and gets the ratings. The audience score, it, it's reliant on people coming in. And as I've said, there's no regulation on it. You know, of course, a critic can only submit one review, but over in the audience section, you know, who knows? I mean, people are very good at gaming uh, the system, if they, especially you know, fanboys. So I would, I just do not, I think that in terms of an, an audience reasoning, that's why you go to the box office. If a movie is successful, people will pay to see it. They will tell their friends to see it. They will see it multiple times. And that's why the box office is the determining factor about audience approval. There could be cult hits. No one would not say, and no matter how Man of Steel does at the box office, that's not going to negate 
the large contingent of people who do like it. I'm just saying there's a large contingent of people who don't like it. So the way this is going to be settled is to whether or not it is a success at the box office. And that answer isn't in yet. So that's a, that's a quick crash course on Rotten Tomatoes. Uh, that is today's episode of Morning Movie News. Thank you for watching. Uh, also, thank you to everybody who's making this a part of their routine. I've been seeing some wonderful comments. It means so much to me that you would make this show and my analysis of the movie news a part of your day. Uh, and thank you for uh, make, and taking the time to watch it. I'm having fun doing this. I'm having fun interacting with you in the comments. I love being able to do it daily. Uh, and so uh, leave your comments today and any stories you'd like to see covered tomorrow. Okay, bye.